Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hammer Podcast. Today is April 16th, and we're live with Katie. Who are we live with? <laughs> Katie, that's a, a kind of an odd way to spell it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I just wanted to make sure, Katie, I didn't want to say your name incorrectly. Okay. So bef before we start, make sure you subscribe to the channel, okay? And uh, like the video. It helps with the algorithms. And we have a, a Another person coming on tomorrow. Usually I'm only doing this on Mondays and Tuesdays, but um, he wants to come on. He's got a really, I guess, horrific story is the only way to say it, at the Family Foundation. So uh, his name is Salerno, M. Salerno. And uh, I have a lady from New Bethany coming up on the, I believe it's the 23rd. And... Uh, Brian is on the 29th, for also from the Family Foundation. And the 30th, I'm having a Vietnam veteran who is in the Vietnam War. He's going to tell us his story about his tour of duty there. All right. So let's go ahead and get started here. So, Katie, you were at the Family Foundation School. What years did you go there? So I was there from 99 to 2000, just shy of a year, like 10 and a half months, I think June to May or July to May, somewhere around there. Um, I was 15 when I got sent away. Um, you know, typical troubled teen. I wasn't too crazy. Um, you know, just kind of a brat running away from home. Um, yeah. You know, didn't love school, fought with my parents, you know. Who, who, who doesn't love school, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, smoking pot, drinking, you know, that was about the extent of it. Nothing, nothing too crazy for a 15 year old, but um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a great kid. I was, I was pretty bratty. Um, my, I had two older brothers who um, were getting in some, some bigger trouble. So I think it was more of a, um, let's save the third one, um, you know, kind of attempt from the parents. Um so they uh, told me we were going shopping, mm -hmm. um, did not tell me we were going to a, a school in the middle of the summer. It was my last um, expectation. <laughs> and uh, we did. We went shopping. We went to um, the Allen Malls in Pennsylvania and uh, did some shopping. And uh, uh, let's see, my mom and my dad both, both took me um, initially. And then my dad uh, disappeared to I don't know, go to cas casinos there, I guess. Um, I guess he couldn't handle dropping me off and left it to my mom. So, oh, yeah. So I was asleep in the back of the car, thought we were going to uh, the car rental place to pick my dad up. And uh, I woke up in the parking lot at the family school. Wow. Still thought it was a car rental place. <laughs> <laughs> didn't didn't click you know it's like i said it's middle of summer you know i'm 15 I, it's just the last place you expect to be and i also yeah. thought we were in new jersey so i started noticing all these license plates from new york and got a little kind of weird feeling but still it just didn't click <laughs> until i walked i mean i literally walked up to the steps of the school and um once i walked in the door um and somebody walked up to me on uh, one of the staff um had staff walked up and said you must be caitlin <laughs> I was like, what the hell kind of car rental place is this? Um, <laughs> they know your name. My goodness, yeah, what a great yeah, car place. Yeah, you have some hot chocolate for me or something. You know, I, it was just very, yeah. um, very shocking, I guess. Um, and they came out and told me, you know, um, this is a, a boarding school. We're here to help you. Um, you know, your parents um, need some help. And I, I don't remember the whole spiel, but, you know, I think I just was probably blank faced for a little while. Um, I had maybe two minutes to say goodbye to my mom and then she just dipped. Um, they brought me in, you know, searched through all of my stuff that I had just bought. Um, not knowing I'm picking out comforters and sheets and all this stuff for my new uh, boarding school. And um, they, they did my strip search and intake. Um, I did try to run the first day, just run, you know, out the door that I walked in and they tackled right. me and restrained me. Um, and I just gave up, you know, I had three or four staff um, just restraining me. So I think at that point I realized I wasn't getting anywhere. And, um, right. You know, I was there. Um, I remember the first night, um, you know, they're very strict. I'm sure you've heard they're very strict on food. They like to use food right. as punishment, as incentive. And your, your, your audio is cracking a little bit. Um, Let me see what I can do here. 
mute it and and bring it back. Okay. Is uh, that any better? Still crackling. Okay. Um. Hmm. That's interesting. Why don't okay. we? Yeah. Tell you I what. might be able to tether to my phone. I might be able to fix it. Or we have cheap Wi-Fi. Hang on just a sec. So while she's fixing that, like I said, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Make sure that uh, if you want to be on the podcast, uh, text the number below right here. Um, and whatever subject you want to talk about, we will talk about it. Okay. Uh, like I said, I have some. Go ahead. Is that better? No, you're still crackling. Tell you what, why don't you go ahead and. Hang up and then come back on. We'll see okay. if that works. Okay. All right. So she, while she's doing that, like I said, uh, we have somebody coming on who was on the, the Vietnam War, the 20, uh, the 30th, which is a Tuesday at five o'clock. I try to do these on Mondays and Tuesdays because on Mondays and Tuesdays, really not a lot of stuff going on with people. So we uh, it, people have more time to, to watch live uh, podcasts. Okay. And like I said, if you have any, anybody who's been to the family foundation school, please have them text the number down here in the bottom. Where is it at? Right here somewhere right over here. Yeah. Right over here. And, uh, have them, uh, I'll, I'll schedule a time. We have the whole month of May open. Like I said, Mondays and Tuesdays at 5 PM central standard time. Okay. So while, uh, Katie's coming back, um, if you want to, uh, get, I'm on X, which is a Twitter. Okay. She's back on. Let's see. Ah, there she is. Now? Ah, that's better. It's better. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I don't, I don't happen. Um, so you're talking about food. They use food yeah, as a yeah, weapon. Yeah. yeah. So they give you 24 hours where they, um, they allow you to, um, deny food. You know, you can, you cannot eat for 24 hours. I guess they figure you're in shock and, um, after that, there's no questions asked. You eat every last bit on your plate. Um, so the first night, I think they had uh, baked ziti or something. And, you know, it's it's institutional food. It takes getting used to. Very different <laughs> yeah. than what you're used to eating at home. Uh -huh. And um, I got sick. I threw up from the first meal that I had to eat. It had been a day. I went about a day without eating. And then the first dinner, um, you know, I was forced to eat. And I threw up. And they said, you either eat it now or you eat it cold for breakfast in the morning. And, you know, I, I thought there's no way they're going to make me do that. Um, they did. So the next morning, you know, I wake up, I'm hungry. I've barely eaten for two days and um, they wouldn't let me have anything else until I ate. Not not regurgitated food. It was um, just what was left over of what I had. Right. Anyway. So they do a lot of a lot of that. They're very strict on the food. Um, you know, they told me I couldn't talk to my parents um, for a month, no calls, no letters, no um, interaction at all. And um, sorry, I wasn't sure if you were still there. Yeah, um, still here. yeah, so I remember maybe the second day that I was there, I actually saw um, a girl that I recognized um, from church. I didn't really know her, she was a little older. She was a like an acquaintance of my brother. And I remember getting real excited that I, saw a familiar face and, you know, waving at her and trying to get her attention. And I don't even know that I knew her name at that point, but, um, you know, she was just ignoring me. She just looked the other way and just completely ignored me. And that's when I found out, you know, we couldn't talk to anyone if we knew anyone or knew of anyone who was already there that we weren't allowed to, um, to speak to anyone. So, um, I was a little disappointing and, yeah. uh, you know, after the first day of trying to run, like I said, you know, I realized I wasn't getting anywhere. I had no idea where I was. I, you know, was asleep in the car. I felt like we were out in the middle of nowhere. Um, really, I just kind of just decided to comply and, and try to follow the rules. Um, very similar to Julie, who you had on here yesterday. I think her name was Julie. Um, uh -huh. You know, compared to a lot of the kids, um, I didn't have, you know, any major abuse. I mean, verbal abuse. Not that that's okay, but... Thankfully, I didn't, I wasn't physically or sexually abused there. Um, you know, 
mine screwed for sure. Um, and, and saw a lot of really, um, nasty stuff going on there, but I really just played the game and, you know, told them, you know, I'm an addict. Do you want me to be an addict? I'm an addict. Um, you know, that means I get to go to AA meetings occasionally and drink coffee, then I'm an addict. And, you know, I never really got in major trouble. Um, you know, I, I struggled a little bit with the um, academics. They were definitely harder than what I was used to. Um, plus you're under all the stress of just the whole situation you're in and, and missing home and whatnot. Um, so really, I didn't have any issues major. I kind of just kind of slid under the radar. Um, you know, I never became like senior student um, to where I was like, um, they have, if you've been there for a while, I'm sure, you know, other people have mentioned this where they have like the trusted um, students where they right. Right. Uh, are kind of in charge of the others. I was kind of always in the middle, you know, they didn't feel like I was going to run away. So they never really had me um, under like major watch. Um, I was kind of just quiet and tried to keep to myself. I was nice to everybody and just tried not to screw with anyone. Um, and tried to avoid eye contact with a lot of people because even that could get you in trouble. You know, you're caught flirting with a boy, looking at him for too long. Then, right. Um, what what about not. your intake? Did your intake go pretty smooth? Um, I mean, after I tried to run out the door and got tackled, <laughs> um, you know, uh, after that part, I mean, they did have they had a um, a junior uh, sponsor or whatever they were called um, with the staff that did the strip search. You know, they make you do the squat and cough and. I thought that was a little crazy. You know, I'd never been in trouble with the law yeah. or anything. So yeah. definitely. That's felt. usually, that's usually reserved for, for prisons and right. jails. Right. Yeah. Not, um, not boarding thought, schools. <laughs> yeah. It felt like a movie really. Um, so yeah, that, you know, I felt violated for sure. Um, and I think they found some, some pot seeds in my bag because my mom used my brother's book bag to pack my stuff. And that was, oh. <laughs> um, but anyways, you know, it, it was, uh, I mean, it was traumatic, you know, you're in the middle of summer. I'm, you know, coming, I think I'm going back to work for the rest of the summer and going to see my friends and um, just kind of dropped off in the middle of nowhere. Thankfully, I wasn't um, kidnapped like some of the, a lot of the students were, you know, in the right. middle of the night. Um, that would have been really rough, but. Yeah, escorts. So that, yeah, so that's how I got there. Um, you know. Like I said, I didn't have um, a terrible stay. I do think um, I was in family four. Um, thankfully, I was not mm -hmm. in Paul um, Paul's family. I think that was probably the worst one. I think he was family six. They were they were two rooms over from us, and we could hear him scream. I mean, no. way down the hall all the time. And he just he gave me the creeps. Um, but our family was. Uh, I mean, none of the staff were particularly nice. They all. I think they had some. Uh, a little bit of uh, sadistic tendencies, you know, most, most of the staff that were there did. Um, there might have been a few that, that actually cared and maybe thought what they were doing was right. I, I don't know. Um, but our family, I think, was the mildest at the time. I don't know if that changed, you know, afterwards, but right. um, they were all still pretty, you know, a bunch of recovering addicts that don't have any credentials to be working with uh, children. Um, you know, yeah, pro lucky, probably... But, it's probably like friends and family, you know what I mean? That that they have work there. Referrals, you know, so, keep it all. Yeah, keep it all. On yeah, the no, no background checks or nothing like that. It's just yeah, well, yeah. I know, I know you. No other jobs yeah. available, probably. Yeah, could be, could be. Yeah, I, I, don't I don't know. know. It's just, uh, I mean, usually schools, whether it's state-run schools or any type of school. They need to have background checks to make sure that that person that they're hiring is not For sure. a sex addict or sex offender, I should say, right. yeah. uh, a person who's got felonies and stuff like that. But I guess I guess a family foundation was a different kind of school. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were very different. I don't think their vetting process was uh, above board exactly. But, um, yeah. you know, and I've heard other people on here and on just different, you know, there's stuff about our school all over the place. And I heard people mention that there are, you know, that the staff was maybe brainwashed and, and thought that they were doing the right thing. And I, I mean, maybe a couple of them that weren't really involved with a lot of the day to day. There were a couple teachers there that really just taught and you didn't really see them a whole lot more. Um, uh -huh. 
I, I just have to think you still had a moral compass. Like, you know, you just knew, you had to know that what was going on there was wrong. Like, there's just no, uh, there's no explanation other than just being crazy. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. But uh, most of them were just crazy. They were all, you know, it was on a power trip to um, make them felt, make themselves feel better. Um, and just, they had kids that, they had, you know, specific kids. Thankfully, I wasn't one of them, but they would definitely find um, the, the most, you know, kind of weakling of the group who um, was just most vulnerable. And they would just, just nonstop, you know, over and over and over. They just picked on these poor kids. And I can sure. see why so many are severely traumatized by the place. I mean, I thankfully, I don't feel super traumatized. I think that, um, you know, I'm 40 and I, I do still have nightmares about the place. Not every night, not even like, I don't know, a couple times a year. I have a dream that I'm either a kid again, getting taken back or, you know, I'm going to an adult version of the school. I mean, it's, it wasn't an easy experience, but I think some kids had it. Most, a lot of kids had right. it. Whole time, of course. Have you ever had one of those dreams where you're an adult, you go back over there and you start beating the shit out of all the staff? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, you have? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call oh. those nightmares, though. Those are the good no, ones. Those are the good dreams, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as the uh, discipline, I mean, I know, I know, I don't know, I think it was before your time where they had the uh, the blankets and the duct tape and all that stuff. Yeah, that was before, before so, my time. So what did they do? They just throw you in the corner? Did they... Yeah, they yeah. had a lot of, um, they'd, you know, make you stand in a corner, take your shoes, um, make you stand there all day. I mean, to me, it didn't make sense that parents were paying all this money, sending their kids. And some of these kids were on work sanctions for six months or even longer, where they weren't even in school. They weren't, you know, they had no education the whole time. They were literally just working, carrying rocks up and down, you know, with buckets and just doing work that made no sense at all. Um they had, they did have the isolation room when I was there. I was never in it. Oh. Um, you know, they threatened it to people, you know, um, sure. they would leave them in there for, you know, really long amounts of time, feed you, um, dry, I think it was dry English muffins and dry tuna and warm water was, um, what your, uh, menu was for all meals. And sounds pretty gourmet to me. <laughs> yeah. Better than ziti, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, it was, and they had a lot, just weird, crazy sanctions, you know? I mean, they had a couple of girls in our family group. Um, I think they were flirting or, you know, they had a crush or whatever they deemed um, wrong. They'd cut their hair, you know, into short, I mean, almost shaved, cut, you know, really short kind of boy haircuts and um, make you wear ugly clothing, you know, dress you every day to just look terrible and... Um, I don't know. They had all kinds of crazy things where you had to say specific things when you were addressed. Um, I know one of one of the guys that was on here, I can't remember what his was, but something about, you know, I don't know more than everyone else or something like that. I mean, just crazy, like culty, weird, weird shit. Yeah. I don't think came up with this sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you was one, you know, they could if they had to, anything they said, right. like literally anything. Um you know, there was work sanctions. I mean, the students, the students, um, we took care of all the cleaning and cooking and, and um, all the chores, all the laundry we had. All yeah. of our um, chores were built into the school day. So we had school every day from, I don't know, 8 a.m. until about 6. And then we had our two-hour dinner that, where that's where they had all the table topics. And, um, yeah. you know. I, I know. I know some of the stuff, uh, I, I think it was Casey. I think I, we were. I was talking to the family foundation, and he was talking about some. I mean, whenever they would be on punishment, they would have to say what their. I guess when they do the table topics and they oh inventory, something. and every time they meet somebody, they have to say exactly what they did. And I, he would say one kid uh, would shake somebody's hand and go, "Hi, I'm so and so. I masturbate a lot and all that." Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Just embarrassing stuff. I mean, really. Crazy. Yeah, they had a they had a really sick obsession with sex. It was talked about all the time, and I mean, which is fine in the right setting. But you know, you've got adult sex offender staff, and you know, poor vulnerable kids. Um, definitely right. inappropriate there. Um, that all kind they just had they they made up uh, or like blackout. They did a whole lot of um, you know just um, alienating kids and separating them, and you know you can't talk to any. Some kids couldn't talk at all. They couldn't talk to staff. Couldn't talk to students. I mean. 
they really just, I don't know. They were just, hmm. they were. But what about if you needed like medical attention? How are you going to? Yeah, I mean, we had a, um, we had a lady who was a nurse. Um, actually her son was in my family at the school. Um, I know, and, I know, but I'm, I'm saying if you, if you couldn't talk to the staff, how are you going to oh. say, Hey, you know, I, I got, you know, this ailment, I need, I need a doctor or I need a nurse yeah. or something. How are you going to tell them? I mean, you right. tell them you're going to get yourself sanctioned again. Yeah, I mean, it was I'm a, sure. it was a no win, no win scenario there. Yeah. I mean, there was limited medical attention anyways, you know, yeah. I, I keep up with a couple of people from the school still. And I mean, I know there's medical issues that they're dealing with still from, you know, 30 years ago of not being able to either have their medication or just seek treatment that they needed. Um, right. Yeah, it was, uh, they were pretty crazy. Um, and, you know, I know y'all talked, go ahead. Go so. ahead. No, I was no, just going to say y'all talked a little bit about the living situation um, or, you know, the dorms we had. Um, we just had trailers. It was bare bones, you know, just these little uh, modular trailers where you just had bunk beds and two bathrooms and you had, you know, 14, 16, however many um, girls on one side, boys on the other. It was freezing in the winter. You know, we had four minute showers. You had a shower timer that was there. You know, you get in trouble if you take a four and a half minute shower. Um, barely any water pressure in our shower. I remember assembly lines, we had filling water bottles, passing them along to try to be able to shower and yeah, I mean, crappy conditions, you know? And I mean, all the money that our parents paid for what? <laughs> like, where was that going? Into the pockets of of the uh, the owners or the right. CEOs of that place. But I've, I've seen pictures of that place. You know, it's huge. Yeah. It's like they didn't have dorms inside, you know, heating. I mean, if, if, if your parents are paying that much money for this, they should have been able to, you know, you should have been well off as far as, yeah. you know, comforts and, and everything. But it's in a trailer. Jeez. Yeah, you would you think know? it would be a little better, but it was pretty, pretty bare bones. Um, and, it, and it wasn't just American people. It was, you know, I had one with Stephanie a couple of weeks ago. She was from England. Yeah. You know, she was yeah. there. We they were bringing them from. And our group. Yeah, they, they were bringing them from, from Europe and yeah. else. China, all so, over. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. Yeah, it's it's bizarre. Um, Yeah. And then the food, you know, back to the food thing. I hadn't heard anyone mention how, you know, they, they called it the family 50. So everyone gained 40 to 50 pounds come in there. I mean, I gained 40 pounds. And, you know, when you develop that as a young teen, like that's something you're going to struggle with for life, trying to, right. you know, just, yeah, it, it was a mess. Um, you know, you know, when I first heard that, uh, after the podcast was over, I was thinking, you know, why would they, why would they make you, or that, why would they not care if you gained weight? I mean, that much weight, you know, 40, 50 pounds. And then I thought to myself, well, first of all, if you're that overweight, then doing chores and, you know, moving rocks and all that kind of stuff, that would seem kind of miserable. You'd be really yeah. worn out. And if you tried to escape, you're not going to get very far. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to yeah. be able to run very fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think maybe they deliberately made you gain weight. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that and then just to lower your self-esteem. and I mean... No, but that's your only, it's your only consolation that you have. It's your, you know, the only thing you have to look forward to is like bread. You know, I've got bread coming up at lunch. It's the only exciting thing about my day. So carbs, carbs. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I've, I've had some, some people comment on these podcasts saying, well, you never get anybody on the podcast that says anything good about the, about the school. And I comment back saying they never call me. They never text me. Nobody, yeah. nobody calls me and says, "Hey, I had a great time at that place. It was yeah. heaven on earth." No, I mean, if that person is out there and they want to come on, hey, I, yeah, I'm willing, I don't know I'm how willing it to was. talk. And I don't know how it was after I left. I did hear that they, you know, they tightened up a little bit on some of their um, procedures that they had in place when I was there because I think, you know, they did start to bring in, um, you know, a low level of oversight maybe I, I don't know once um the internet became a thing um yeah. maybe they they kind of had to crack down a little more so i don't know maybe it got a little better but it didn't sound like it i mean everything i've read and heard from kids that were there even 10 15 years after me 
um, you know, it still sounded pretty, pretty terrible. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know how they lasted as long as they did and, and, you know, had that many staff that were involved. I mean, it's just sadistic and it's, it's bizarre. And like I said, I yeah. never, I was not, um, I was compliant, you know, to the point of, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dig in too far to where I'm, you know, actively hurting people, but I'm going to just kind of stay under the radar and do my work and not look at people and be nice to everyone. And, you know, I, I would have probably been okay and just finished out my 18 months and, you know, still been pissed off, but would have been fine. And, you know, they, I, I've heard other people say it too, but they gaslight people. I mean, if you, if you behave, they force you into, they force your hand to where, so with me, um, my parents had an outing. So um, as you know, usually you can't leave the school. Um, you're, you're there all the time. I think I left twice for um, AA meetings with, you know, staff and a couple students. And I think we went on a trip to Baltimore, which is very close to where I live, which was very tempting to, to run away on that trip, but they, they scare you so badly from running away. And so I went on a trip with my parents to um, New York City and um, they came and took me for the weekend. And, you know, at this point, I've been there about 10 months or so. And you can't, you can't even enjoy your outings. You're so paranoid, you know, the whole time. I'm just, I'm so paranoid that I'm going to do something negative. And I just know I'm going to get in trouble when I get back. Um, I remember walking into a clothing store in the city and it was like rap music. And I'm like, oh, got to walk out of here. You know, it's negative. I'm going to be in trouble. And, <laughs> I think we walked through a, um, a, a pot legalization parade and, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I didn't do anything right. I'm walking down the street. And I mean, did you, just, did you, did you trust that, that your parents wouldn't say anything after you got back? You know, cause I'm sure the staff would probably ask them, Hey, you know, how, how did it go? You know, they yeah. might accidentally set, let's say, let something slip, you know, say, well, we were at this. Well, oh, wait, oh, I should have said that, you know, then you're in trouble. You know what I mean? Sure. I don't know that it was really worrying about my parents so much it's just they screw with your head so much you literally I mean it's like you're you have such a conscience where I mean I think that's the one thing for me that came out of being there is that like I just I can't lie I have a hard time you know I I, I feel badly even stupid little things I just I can't I don't I, I have a really hard time with it and I was not like that before I went so maybe that's one good thing that that came out of it but I wasn't concerned with, with my parents saying something. I think I was just, I knew that they were going to get it out of me and that I was going to feel bad and I was going to have to right. admit it. So I, I did nothing. You know, my, my brother started talking to me about a, a friend from home. I said, nope, I can't talk about them. I'm not allowed. I'm going to get in trouble. I mean, any little thing. And I, it was right. just miserable. It was a terrible trip. And they brought me back from the weekend and, you know, I went over everything that happened, you know, stood up on my little, you know, in front of um, everyone on my table topic and told them about my outing. And, mm. you know, they asked me a bunch of questions, you know, they, I guess I failed, um, I failed some tests uh, in New York. You have to take uh, regions exams to pass the grade. And I was uh, approaching the end of 10th grade. Um, I think it ended, it would have ended in June. And so you have to take a pre-regions exam to, to be able to go on and, and to take the regions. And I failed it. Well, I failed it because I hadn't had a full year of school. I just wasn't ready. And, you know, I'm in a stressful environment. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I just failed it. Right. And so they brought me up in, you know, their little gavel at the table. And, um, and they were convinced that I just did something terribly wrong on my outing. And they just wouldn't let it go. You know, I swore up and down. Right. I said, I, I didn't do anything, call my parent. Like, I literally did everything I was supposed to do. I, I, I didn't do anything wrong. And they just wouldn't let it go. They said, well, you know what? You're not talking to your family until you tell us what you did. I was like, I want to call my parents. They said, absolutely not. I was like, y'all are fucking crazy. So <laughs> I waited. And so that's when I ran. I ran away. I waited. Um, I think it was like maybe two nights after that. Because the first night after that table topic, for some reason, they didn't take my shoes. Usually they take, you know, someone's shoes every time they get in trouble because they're worried they're going to run away. But right. that I was so compliant, I think they just thought I would never run. I wasn't a flight risk. Um, so they didn't take my shoes. I don't think they really knew what to do with me. Um, they still had me on breakfast crew. So as I said, for um, for all the chores, we did all the chores. And so 
the only time you can be by yourself. Um, so even if you're a trusted student, they never really trust you. So they've got other trusted yeah, sure. students that have to, you know, you always have to be with somebody. And so the only time yeah. that's the exception is um, breakfast crew. And so I earned breakfast crew and uh, woohoo. And um, so I was trusted. I was able to um, walk from the trailer down to the kitchen alone. So big deal. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So they didn't take that away for some reason. They should have. But um, so I waited and, and, and until they turned the alarms off in the, in the dorm. They turn them off early in the morning for, for breakfast crew. And I waited and I watched everyone else from breakfast crew. You know, I, I hid behind like, I don't know, some air conditioned unit or something that was outside and watched everyone walk down to the kitchen. And I just took off and I just started running and ran towards the woods and kept going and kept going. Yeah. You know, I, um, I came you out. Didn't follow, to, you didn't follow the road, did you? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. They, they told, they, they warned you about that. I mean, that you know, people have said this before. I've heard um, on here as well, where they, they make everyone very scared to run away. They tell you you're going to either get eaten by some sort of wild something. You're going to get raped by some wild man that lives, you know, in the cabin in the woods, or you're going to get caught. Um, they have stories of kids making it all the way to California and getting, you know, caught. Yep bus you know they're waiting for them when they get off and take them right back and all kinds of stories they tell to um you know to scare the kids and i mean i was scared i was, I was 15 of course i was scared but i knew sure. that it was a better alternative to staying i knew i had seen what these kids went through and i knew what my future looked like if i was stuck there and i had no way to reach my parents so so i left you know i left in the morning and i ran I don't know, this was what, 25 years ago, but probably two months, you know, for two hours. I ran for long enough to, to know that nobody was going to be looking for me before I came out anywhere near to do a road. You know, I was just running through right. woods. I was filthy. I had my shoes were soaked. I was been running forever. I came out to um, a little, uh, two little farmhouses and just picked one and went and knocked on the door and um, I made up a story. I, you know, I didn't tell them that I was from the school because we also were warned that, you know, all the locals know that, you know, we're a bunch of messed up kids. They know if they see you to call the police. And so I just told them that I uh, was visiting my dad. I was, you know, my mom lived in Rich where I'm from and that I needed to get back to her. We had a fight and that I just needed some help. And so they let me in and let me use her phone and um, she said, well, I know a preacher who gives people money for bus tickets when they're in need. And she took me to a little church in Hancock and dropped me off with the preacher. And, you know, I don't think he bought my story. I think he knew there was a lot more to it. I mean, I hadn't lied in a year anyway, so I definitely wasn't very good at it. But um, he bought me a bus ticket and took me to lunch and sent me on my way. And I, I went back home and um, ended up getting sent back. Oh, uh, no, oh, just almost. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't, I didn't have to stay. I, I didn't end up staying. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let me come back. But, um, so I was gone for, oh, uh, okay. but yeah, I was gone for four or five days. So I, I came home. I did not go home initially. I went and got with some friends and went and hung out with my brother. I happened to be beach week the same week. So I went to the beach for a few days and, you know, partied harder than I ever had because I thought this is probably my last hoorah. I'm going to be sent back. And so right. we went to the beach a few days and then went home. Um, you know, my parents convinced me to go home. Of course, the school had called them, told them I ran away. And uh, they convinced me. They said they were going to start sending police officers to all my brother's friends' houses till they found me. So, oh, so I went home and my dad, you know, he said, look, they, at this point, I think they started to realize the school was a little crazier than what they initially thought. Um, but they felt like they just spent, you know, 40 grand or whatever it was for the year. And I never even completed the 10th grade. And so they said, well, just go back, go back for a month. If you agree to go back for a month and finish up your credits, just don't run away, be compliant. And we promise we'll come get you. And I'm like, well, you did drop me off in the middle of the summer last year. And, you know, a little untrusting, but um, you know, I also gave the address to several friends and to my brother and knew that one way or another, I was going to be out of there in a month. And so I did agree to go back and, uh, I tried to tell my parents that they're not going to let, you know, they're not going to agree to just have me come back and do school. That's not how this place works. And I'm going to have like some hardcore consequences and they're not even going to let me do school, you know? So 
I came back and um, they did my intake again. It was like deja vu, you know, strip search, the whole nine. And mm. I'll never forget walking back in the door. One of the um, the one of the heads of the the family looked at me and she said, Caitlin. So I guess it wasn't as it wasn't as pretty on the outside as it is as you thought or something. You know, you couldn't handle it. And I said, No, actually, I, I ran away and I made it home. But I've agreed to come back, you know, just for school. Right. And uh, one of the girls, one of the students that was helping with my intake, she said, yeah, that's what they told me two years ago. I was like, shit. (laughs) (laughs) So they did my intake. And uh, next thing you know, one of the other staff, she comes in and she said, go get your shit. You're going home. So my dad had met with them and and he told them, he said, I'm I'm not going to do this again. You know, I, I promised her that she wouldn't have to stay longer than a month. And. They said, no, they said, she'll leave when we say she's ready to leave. Otherwise, oh. she's not staying. And my dad was like, nope. And so he took me home and that was, you know, that was the end of it there. I mean, I, I went up to yeah. the dorms and grabbed my stuff and, you know, I didn't get to say goodbye to anyone. Of course, they weren't allowed to talk to me. They were instructed to not, you know, not speak to me and um, connected with a few people, uh, you know, a year or so after that. But never really got to say goodbye and um, just left. And they ne- they refused to send any sort of transcript. So I missed the whole hmm. year of 10th grade. You know, I'd done way more 10th grade than most students do. And um, so we ended up, I finished um, high school through homeschool and dual enrollment through a college. And my mom made up some tests. She was a teacher. So she, you know, we worked oh. it out. It, yeah. it was made very difficult. The school made it very difficult for me to kind of, slide back in and, and fall back into finishing. You know, if, if your mom was a teacher, why did you even go to that school? She could have just homeschooled you and taken you to some program or something to like AA or. or no, so. she wouldn't. Have, it wouldn't. I was an asshole. I mean, I, my mom and I did not get along. I mean, I, 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 I was a difficult kid. I mean, I, I don't think anyone deserved to be in that situation, but I do understand. I have kids, you know, I've got teens and I understand. Thankfully mine are way better than I was, but I, I understand when you're desperate, you know, you don't, you didn't have access to internet and to see what this place really was. All you're seeing is these pamphlets and you're, you're hearing from students who are brainwashed or who, you know, they're scared and they're, they're right. promoting, you know, they don't, I mean, I, I never really, I, I, I wasn't really angry with, I mean, I was upset and, and hurt, but I also understood, even as a kid, I don't even think it was to the point once I became a parent, I think before then, I understood that they just, they didn't know. Most of the parents did not know what was going on and they were doing their best. They were trying to, you know, save us. And it was from a place of love for sure, but just misguided a hundred percent. Yeah. Plus they had uh, incomplete information. Too. For sure. Yeah. But you they know. didn't, they didn't know that, you know, they had, yeah. I mean, in my case, I think there were two kids that were there that had been there from our church and their parents, you know, they were, they were still there and, and doing well as far as they knew. And I mean, you look at the yearbooks and you have all these success stories and, you know, you come and take a tour and you have some kid who's, you know, just chomping at the bit to walk out the door when they're 18, but they tell you how wonderful and you know, how they used to be a crackhead and now they're going to college and, you know, it's, they just didn't know. And so I get it. I mean, yeah. Yeah. In my situation, I do think there are different circumstances for kids where, you know, there's a little more malicious intent with the parents, but my, I had great parents. I was just a jerk. You know, I was um, a tough kid and uh, yeah. It didn't, it didn't brainwash you though. It didn't break you. No, you know? no. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, it, it taught me some resilience and, you know, I've been through other things obviously since then, but, um, I, you know, I had a little period where I partied pretty hard afterwards and, you know, made some poor decisions, never gotten into, into any trouble or anything, thankfully, but, um, you know, everyone has their different ways of dealing with trauma. And, um, unfortunately so many, um, of the alumni from there, you know, aren't, aren't alive to tell their story and, you know, had it worse. I mean, a lot of kids really suffered some severe, severe abuse. And a lot of people don't, they just don't get over that, you know, and it's, it's, right. I'm glad it's shut down now. I'm thankful that it's, you know, they had the truth campaign going on. And, you know, I sent in my testimony. I didn't get super involved in that. Um, I don't have social media. I just kind of, kind of live under a little rock and, um, you know, 
keep keep in touch with some people from there, but I haven't been super involved with uh, any of the stuff that's been going on since I left. But I do know that they got shut down, and I was very happy to hear that. And are sadly, you, you... there's still other ones that are open. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> there is. They're all over the place, thousands yeah. and thousands of them. But like I said, when you have a state that's that's not regulating these schools, yeah. no oversight, they're gonna they're allowed to do whatever they want to do until yeah. something happens. When if somebody gets hurt or somebody gets killed, then that's when the state the state uh, you know comes in and it's by then it's too late. Yeah, you know I mean they'll shut it down, but they'll just move to another state that doesn't have oversight. So. Yeah, same staff move, you know, they move staff around and yeah. change. I, think, I mean, family school changed to what Allenwood at some point um, in the last few years before they finally, finally got shut down. But, you know, it's just there's lasting scars and it's so sad to see. Um, I mean, I, mean I, I would say I'm a success story, not because of the school, but like I don't have complaints. You know, I don't have major trauma from there. I don't have my life is good. I'm, you know, I'm a happy person. Um, but I would say that's in spite of the school, not be, not because of it for sure. Um, and so right. many people don't, they don't have, you know, I, I don't know. It's just, it's terrible. I, I was thinking yesterday, actually Grace that was on here, um, lives like an hour from me. So we catch up once a year or so. And, um, we were talking about our, our family and, um, I think there were five, five, just in the 10 and a half months that I was there, there's five kids that are no longer living and, you know, a couple of them OD'd, you know, most of them are really just not, I mean, probably from lasting effects and, and trauma from what they went through. It's, it's sure. just. Well, like you said, people deal with it in different ways. Some sure. people decide to just say, you know what, I'm going to get through this and I'm going to keep going. Yeah. You know, some say, well, I guess I better go back to the heroin or to the, or to the meth, you know, that'll, yeah. that helps, you know, keep, uh, keep their mind you know, away from all that trauma. You know? Right. Well, and I think it matters too what sort of support system you're coming home to, you know. I mean, I had yeah. I was terrified to like do anything wrong when I first ran away because I didn't you know, I knew I'm I'm I was only 16 at the time. I had just turned 16, so I still had two and a half potential year or two years that I could have been sent back. And so I I stayed out of trouble just out of fear that, you know, I knew that was kind of not that my parents threatened it. They didn't really hang it over my head, but I think I was just, I knew where I could end up. And so I just stayed out of trouble and, and tried to behave. But, you know, at this point, um, I have a really close, my dad's past, but I have a really close relationship. My mom's my, my best friend and, you know, we've moved on and I have a great family and really good friend group and just a really good support system. But I think a lot of kids that left, they didn't have that, you know, they, I mean, their family relationships were broken when they left because of the school and, right. you know, they never got that back. And so do you, do you, are there any, are there any Facebook groups out there that uh, you're a part of? I don't have Facebook. I don't, I don't. Oh, do you Facebook. don't. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, I guess that's, probably, a good, that's a good thing. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I, yeah, I just stay off of, so I, like I said, I kind of live under a little rock and it's a little happy space and, you know, I keep up. I mean, I do. Right. I do wish that I was able to keep up. There are a lot of alumni, you know. Right. You couldn't you couldn't be super close with people because you could never really get to know someone who they who they really were because, you, you know, you're you're so busy trying to just stay out of trouble or to, you know, in some people's case, get other people in trouble to keep yourself out of trouble. And so um, it is hard to form really um, tight friendships there. Or it was for me. I also was there less than a year. You know, I think the kids that are there for multiple years, they eventually give in and, and they have these, you know, lasting friendships, but, um, or, or lasting trauma. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, for sure. The, um, the longer, the, yeah, the longer you're subjected to that, you know, yeah, for sure. The, the weaker the effects are going to be, but, and then when you yeah. leave, you know, a lot of these kids graduated together and, you know, I ran away alone. So like, I didn't have the opportunity to like, Hey, can I get your phone number? I mean, you know, I, I just, <laughs> I lost touch with a lot of people and, you know, we weren't, we didn't have money or IDs or phone. I mean, we had, we just didn't have anything to, to keep up, you know, when I left. So. Right. Um, huh. So kind of coming back just a little bit, you were talking about how you went with your parents to New York and all that stuff. And you said, it, it, you were basically looking around almost like an escape fugitive, basically. 
you know, you were just like, oh shit, is that person, is that person from the family foundation? Is that person, you know? Oh yeah. 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 You're paranoid the whole time. Just, Very yeah, nice. there's no, there's no comfort and there's no, I mean, I, I don't even remember half the trip. I mean, my mom had to remind me of some of the things because I think I was really right. just so guarded and just wanted to just get it over with and get back before was, I got in trouble. Was there any staff there that, that you got along with that were pretty much sympathetic to, you know, that, that wanted to actually do good there? You know what I mean? Um, I mean, not the assholes, guess, not like, the assholes there. Yeah, I mean, there were definitely some that were way worse than others, um, you know, sure. and then there were some that were more of a kind of neutral, you know, they were still complicit. They might not be the one that's, you know, cursing at the kids at every table topic or calling names or, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I think I had a, a science teacher that was all right, that was kind of nice. I don't think he was super involved with the day to day. I think, I think that was one that I think he just came and taught and pretty nice guy. I, I don't think he was actually part of anyone's family or anything, but yeah. I mean, no, not all the staff were like terrible, sadistic people, but I would say all the ones that were there knew what the hell was going on. So, you know, they, they were still complicit. They were, you know, allowing it to happen, not reporting it. I don't know, still working there, you know, it's, um, Maybe they maybe that was the only job they had or could have and didn't want to get fired. You know, I mean, yeah, maybe you know, whistleblower, you know, tends to get the boot. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but yeah, it's bizarre. I, I'm not sure what you know what the appeal was for for staff, but um, you know, I, I mean, a lot of them were. Most of them, I would say, the majority of them were recovering addicts and alcoholics. You know, they. They were in the um, AA program, and I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure why. But the thing about the AA program, it, it, it seems like you, you're trading one one addiction for another. You know, I mean, I've I've had friends where I, I would I'd never gone to an AA meeting as as you know, say oh, I'm an alcoholic. I'm, a couple of friends of mine were, and they uh, said, "Hey, you want to come and see what it's like?" I'm like, "Sure." I'd go in there, and the place was so foggy with cigarette smoke. It was. <laughs> You know, they trade the alcohol for, like you said, coffee yeah. and, cigarette, and cigarettes yeah. because, you know, that's that's something they can do. You know, they just trade one one addiction for another. Sounds about yeah. right. That's, that, was, <laughs> yeah. that tracks with all the meetings that I've been at least. Um, yeah, that the smoke was thick. Oh, my goodness. Like chain smoking. You know, it's like once they finish the meeting. OK, we're going to take a break or whatever. They all run outside and immediately just start lighting up and just right. smoking as fast as they can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I can't knock it. I, you know, I think there are some people that AA has helped. So I don't have any like, you know, ill will towards AA in general. Right. I think who definitely had a real nasty spin on what AA was supposed to be. Also. I don't I don't know if a well, AA has got kind of, kind of a Christian uh, type of thing where they, you know, a higher power and kind of that kind of stuff, but Family Foundation was not. No, uh, they were uh, affiliated well, with any with any Christian organization. Yeah, it was strange because they didn't claim to be, um, you know, any sort of, like they were non denominational or not. I don't know. They didn't say they were religious, but they still forced you to go every morning. We had some sort of service. You know, we had Jewish service one morning, we had Mass one morning, and then we had Protestant service, and then. I think on the weekends, maybe we would go to a Methodist church occasionally. So, which is fine. I mean, I think it's good for the, for the kids that are practicing each of those to have the opportunity to go, but it was kind of weird that we all had to go to all of them. Like way to confuse right. a kid, you know, I, I don't know. It was just very, <laughs> very strange to me. One morning you're in mass singing hymns the next morning you're speaking in, you know, another, I don't know. It was just speaking in tongues and jumping yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> just very, very strange. Um, yeah, yeah I've, I've been to those Pentecostal churches. Boy, those those are weird people. Yeah. Let me tell well, you. Teach their own, you know. I have no. Problem well, with, I mean, but... I had no idea that they spoke in tongues, and all yeah. of a sudden, you know, a friend of mine invited me. I got some weird friends, you know. They invited oh, me yeah. to this Pentecostal church because I'm not a, I'm not a you know church going guy. Sure. And I figured, you know what? Why not? What the hell? Let's see what it's like. And all of a sudden. 
preachers talking, and then all of a sudden, everybody, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's just like, what in the hell is going on? I mean, people are just going, speaking in this language I've never heard of before. I think, oh, my God, they're possessed. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can see they, how that'd be. A little... they, they, should, they, they should have made the religion equal, too. I mean, why didn't they have a, a Satan, you know, a Satanist come in and, and give a mass or something? I mean, why not? Equal opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. No? I don't know. I think it was. And what's crazy is that, you know, um, even if you um, had uh, food preferences for religious purposes, that was out the window. Right. They would make you eat meat or whatever. And, you know, their their um, rationale for that was because, oh, well, you know, your religion also says you shouldn't be a whore, but you're a whore. So, you know, you, <laughs> you, or, you know, it's um, <laughs> Just, no kosher meals, no kosher yeah. meals for, for the Jews. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, they just, um, so yeah, there were a lot of vegetarian, I mean, whether religious reasons or allergies or, you know, I mean, I think there were several kids there with food allergies. I remember hearing, you know, kids say I'm allergic to this and they'd say too bad, eat it. And, you know, I never saw any like anaphylactic reactions or anything crazy, but yeah. I'm sure there were some kids that got pretty messed up from eating stuff that they had aversions to, but Either that, or they just could have said it. Either that, they just could have said it because they didn't want to eat it. You know. Well, sure. Yeah. They, you know the, the you know that one line that people always use. Well, it's against my religion. Oh, well, okay. Well, <laughs> then we can't give it to you or whatever. You yeah. know, it's that kind of line. Yeah. But yeah. then again, they might be telling the truth. They might be allergic to whatever it is, and then they eat it. Then yeah. they, their face swells up and. Yeah, you know, I'm pretty I sure I tried to I, tell them I was allergic to olives, but uh, that didn't work very well. <laughs> oh, oh, I love olives. Yeah, they made you eat like, everything. They... Yeah, to people that say that, you know, I'm allergic to olives, I'll be like, well, you know what that means? Like, what? It just means more olives for me because I, yeah. loved, uh, I love olives, man, I'll tell you, especially when the Bloody Marys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but so, and you said your, your life is good now. That's good. Yeah, I'm glad to hear I'm it. I'm no complaints, you know, I'm, I'm happy, healthy, got a great family. And, you know, thankfully this was, um, you know, a small part of my life and try not to let it, um, you know, drag me down too much. I mean, it's been 25 years, so it's, it definitely had some, some effects over the years and, um, you know, maybe some trust issues. I wouldn't say anymore by any means, but when I first got out right. for sure. Um, oh. and then just, you know, just hard time forming friendships and, and yeah, just opening up and really trusting people. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, thankfully I um, didn't have any major issues since I've left. And um, unfortunately that's not the case with, you know, so many of the kids out there. I've listened to all kinds of stories and, and read stuff about some of the kids that have passed. And it's. Uh, I've had a couple, actually there was one girl that was on here that said that she actually saw somebody jump off. Yeah. Uh, one of the second story things. Yeah. It's like, man. Yeah, I can't yeah. imagine the trauma of seeing that either. Yeah, that was way after I left, and I remember hearing about it, and it's like, you know, wouldn't that be a sign? You've got kids jumping off balconies. Like, maybe they should look more into what's going on at the school. I mean, it's yeah, um, but I'm sure they had probably had better lawyers and yeah, than the kids did. You know, plausible yeah. deniability. I don't know. He was something wrong with him. Yeah, that's you know. what all our money was buying. All those attorneys, I'm sure. Yep. Yep. So, well, Katie, it was great to have you on. I'm yeah. glad, thank, thank you for coming on in the last the, at the last minute there. Yeah, no that, worries. Uh, Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, that was uh, that pretty much. I mean, it's like I said, it's kind of a pattern, you know. I, I, everyone that's come on with the Family Foundation has had not the same story, but pretty close, you know. And it's like you know. And, and if this had come out, you know, 20 years ago, maybe something would have been done at that time. But yeah. like I said, 20 years ago, the internet, it was still in its infancy. You know, nobody, nobody had any reviews online about these places. So yeah. parents couldn't check, couldn't do their due diligence that way. Now they don't have an excuse. Right. You know, I mean, there's information everywhere about these places. Sure. So yeah, now I think all that information is yeah readily available and yeah, there's there's no excuse. Back then, it was different. They just you know it's just ignorance. Just they didn't know. Yeah, ignorance or just in a hurry to say hey, I need to get this kid somewhere. He's he's a handful and he's driving me up the wall. Yeah. Yeah. 
but you know sometimes that's a decision that's pretty regrettable <laughs> you know yeah i mean i would never send my kids to a boarding school no well they're they're 28 and 27 now but i would never send them to a boarding school i would i would deal with it the best way i could sure yeah so but that's yeah. you know that's that's me everybody's different Sure. Well, yeah. and to be fair, it was initially my idea. I wanted to go to a boarding school. I did not ask for this one, but I did. I did uh, initiate that conversation because I, you know, I wanted to get away from my parents and go somewhere right. and party somewhere else, <laughs> not at the family <laughs> school. But yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no parties at the at the at the family school. Careful so. what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Like I said, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, like I said, we're gonna. Like I said, this is live, so it's just gonna go right right on YouTube, so people can see it. I don't have to edit the stuff anymore. So, gotcha. but um, I'm gonna go ahead and close the podcast. Uh, stay on the line. All right. right. I want to thank everybody who's watching right now. All well, there was a whole bunch. Now there's only eight left, but it's the end of the end of the podcast. But like I said, make sure you subscribe to the channel, and um, like I said, if you want to be on the podcast, just. Uh, Text the number. It's right there on the bottom of the screen, ooh, ooh, right there. And uh, let me know, and I will schedule you in, just like we did with Katie here. She texted the, the phone number, and here she is. <laughs> so, all right. So, for the Hammer Podcast, I'm Jason. You take care of yourself. You take care of each other. And we will see you in the next podcast. <laughs>